breaking the wall between mind and machine. How neurotechnology can expand human capacity for action. Klaus Robert Müller, Technische Universität, Berlin. 20 years ago, breathless and deeply moved, my wife and I followed everything on a tiny black and white TV screen. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, the honor and pleasure um, that I may present the Berlin Brain Computer Interface here at this very special conference. Um, this is joint work um, together with my colleagues Benjamin Blankertz, Michael Tangermann and Gabriel Curio. We all come from different institutions. Um, Gabriel is um, a neurologist from Charité. Um, Benjamin, Michael and I, we share the institution. Benjamin is also with Fraunhofer. Um, this is um, joint work of the Bernstein Center of Neurotechnology. Let us start um, with an example of what a brain-computer interface does. So you see a subject here, he's wearing an EEG cap, 64 electrodes, um, 1000 hertz um, sampling rate, and um, the subject is asked um, to imagine left hand and right hand movements. And by virtue of his thoughts alone, he's controlling um, the cursor that you can see and tries to hit the blue ball as often as possible. Um, so if you watch closely, the subject is not moving and thinking left and right. So since it's not a monkey, you can ask the subject what uh, it, this feels like, and I happen to be the subject here. So I actually was pulling a string, a virtual string in my imagination, to the right and to the left in a very focused and uh, concentrated and relaxed manner. Um, also, I did this for maybe half an hour and then all of a sudden I, I didn't have to do this string pulling anymore, but rather it seemed that this cursor has become part of my body. So I can, can put it in any arbitrary position. So this is often called skill acquisition. So this, this is like if I learn te to play tennis and the tennis, becomes, the tennis racket becomes like my extended arm. So this also happens here. Let me just briefly discuss what kind of walls we have to break to achieve this. First of all, we have to break the wall between physiology and data analysis. So um, my own field is um, data analysis. Uh, so this messy data, we have to decode it um, in real time. And when we started this about 10 years ago, um, we stepped on the uh, shoulder of the pioneers in the field, Bierbaumer, Furcella, and Wulpa. Um, patients had to train about two to 300 hours to, to change their brain signals such that you could decode them. Now, we address this from the other side. So in our case, the machines learn, not the subjects. So we now need about 10 minutes of, of learning on the subject side, and um, this is three orders of magnitude. And by this virtue, we can, you can come to the lab and do the experiment and communicate w with your brain, with the machine, within a single morning. Let me discuss briefly the physiology, because this is part, one part of the story. So since it's late afternoon, if you close your eyes, there's an idle rhythm kicking in at the occipital uh, side, somewhere here in the back of the brain. If you, close, uh, if you open your eyes again, then this rhythm is suppressed. If I keep my arm at rest, there's an idle rhythm over the motor cortex, contralaterally. If I start moving it, this idle rhythm, uh, idle rhythm is suppressed. But the interesting thing is, if I only imagine a movement, then also the idle rhythm is suppressed in a contralaterally way. So left imagination, right hemisphere, right imagination, left hemisphere. So this gives enough physiology to get one bit out of the brain, so to say. 
what are the challenges? Now, as you follow my talk, you, you listen, you watch me, you maybe play with something, and you think about dinner and um, all sorts of things at the same time. So we are actually facing a cerebral cocktail party problem because our sensors, the EEG, picks up superpositions of all the brain signals that are active. So for the purpose of decoding, it's only the motor cortex that is interesting. All the other rest, which is very necessary for living, um, should be suppressed. And that's the challenge how to get out this source of data that we, would really, that we are really after. So if you decided to come to our lab, then um, we would take about um, half an hour for the montage to put the EG on your, on your um, head, to put gel in the electrodes, to sample the electromagnetic uh, fields that is emitted by your brain at 64 positions. And the first thing is a 10-minute training where the subject is um, asked to imagine certain brain states, is asked to assume certain brain states. And we can do this together. Um, so put yourself now into a very special position. So you have to be relaxed and focused, okay, after this long day. Um, you shouldn't move. And um, you should imagine um, a left hand movement and right hand movement. Say squeezing a ball, pulling a string, something like that. Playing the piano. So just try it. Um, so relaxed. Starts immediately. If you see the letter, you have to imagine. Okay, now left imagination. Not anymore. Left imagination again. Not anymore. So you have to keep your eyes open in order to see the screen, of course. Um, now right imagination. So you, this gives you a good impression um, how the training works. After 10 minutes, we have... Um, gathered about 100 data points of leftness and rightness. And now we would like to make with this nice source of data, we would like to infer what are the spatial temporal patterns of left activity and right activity. Um, and this is where machine learning comes into the place. So you see for this one subject that um, left imagination has a very nice map. So this is a view from above to the brain, this is the nose, and this is a sampling of the um, electromagnetic wave fields. So it's right over the motor cortex, and it's a very nice starting point. With this, we can try to infer and distinguish between the two brain states. So we can now use it for the disabled, for example, um, for spelling. And here's uh, a video where we have actually have done the spelling in a very peculiar way. Remember, there's one bit of information, and we translate this bit, right imagination, into turning of the error, left imagination into choosing, elongating the error. And in this way, um, while I'm talking, with two choices, you can go to any letter in the alphabet. And um, I should say, that this um, video was taken at CBIT in 2006. Um, and you could think of about 30 people standing around the subject, maybe two TV cram routines. And it was quite hard for the subject to stay relaxed and focused. Um, I think Guido, who is the subject in this video, only misspelled once when the German science minister put her hand on his shoulder. Um, also, I should say that there was a, behind this white wall here was the main power supply of Hall 8, a cable of this size. So remember, I haven't told you that, but um, an EEG measures between 10 to 15 microvolts. So you have to do the cerebral cocktail party problem well. Um, there's a demo which I would like to um, point to. So uh, we outside, in the coffee room, there's a real-sized um, pinball machine. And we've now um, 
used and you can see yourself that the brain activity of the subject out there is used to control the right and left pedals in this flipper machine. And the interesting thing is you have to get timing and dynamics right. And recall, this is a non-invasive system, so we, are, we don't have brain surgeries here. Um, so, the, of course, uh, it's clear that we are, it, not our, our patients shouldn't start playing pinball, right? So this is not the point. The point is, this is a proxy for showing how fast you can actually communicate with the machine in this time-pressing environment. So, outside the medical world and the more playful world, what are the walls yet to be broken? So, we go out the lab, out of the lab with our EEG system. So, we measure EEG while driving a car. And the idea is to predict cognitive workload while driving or predict drowsiness um, and or assess drowsiness. So, um, or cognitive alertness in real time. So, um, this is already, this is a huge wall to go outside the lab. And um, we've started to get small bricks out of it. And it, it's a very, very interesting world beyond that wall. Um, so, what are future walls to break? Sensors is an issue. So, this e the EEG is, is very close to the classical EEG. So, what Berger invented um, um, in the beginning of the last century. And um, it takes 30 to 45 minutes to, to do the montage. What we would like to have is dry electrodes, contact-free electrodes, a cheap system um, to pull on the cap and start measuring right away. We would like to walk around with an, with an EG in order to observe human decision-making in realistic situation to change man-machine interaction. Because now you always have to wash your hair afterwards and you can imagine um, that I got some funny looks when um, coming to TU computer science department requiring a shower room. So, machine learning has contributed to having the walls fa fall in this field. We can do non-invasive um, transmission with high information rate. At the CBIT video, the subject was able to transfer six to eight bits per minute over the whole period where these experiments lasted six hours. And um, future applications are, of course, rehabilitation. And you, you heard Miguel Nicolelis talk. And I think it's yet to be discussed where non-invasive methods will find their place. Certainly, the data analysis will find its place in the Walk Again project. So we have a new measurement device with which you can look at the thinking and behaving brain in real time. And um, so this is a new device with which you can try to understand, help understanding the brain. It's done in the Bernstein centers. And there's also new ways of man-machine interaction this is uh, that is possible. So we can condition the interaction with the machine on the brain state. There's lots, long ways to go with the sensors and thanks to the BBCI core team and to the European German taxpayers. Thank you very much for your attention.